So how would you solve this? Well, so if they cross a true green line type mm -hmm. with um, now, notice they didn't cross the true breeding wild type, they crossed the true breeding in stems. Okay. To, to a wild type. To a wild type. Um, and. Um, okay, and all of the F1 generation had a wild type. Right. Um, so then. You would know, I mean, you already know that that a thin stem is recessive, right? I think we know that thin stem has to be recessive, that's right, but how do we know that? Um, because it's true breeding, and, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. Because who is true breeding? Because a thin stem is true breeding, and it doesn't show Type, so. so are you saying that thin is dominant or recessive? It's recessive. Hmm. No. That's a little funny to me. I, I would think that if, it's, if they're all true breeding, it would seem more likely that they would be dominant. All right, well, let's go through that together. I think I'm, confused, I'm getting confused by wild. Right, so let's take this step by step. Okay. First of all, what does wild type mean? Um, I thought it meant that you know that it's homozygous. Ah, um, let's clarify that, yes. Wild type just means the most common phenotype. Oh, okay. Wild type just means the most common phenotype. It doesn't tell you anything about the genotype. Um, so you can tell whether something is wild type or not just if you're a good biologist and you go out and do a survey and you see what the wild type phenotype is. So wild type refers to the phenotype, not the genotype. You can see that from the terminology here. Thick is a phenotype, not a genotype, right? So wild type is just the most common phenotype. And then mutant is the other phenotype. That you're focusing on. Mutant is the um, less common phenotype. So all we're saying here is that when you go out and survey nature, they're mostly thick stems. And it's rare that you come into a thin stem. But that doesn't that insinuate dominance? Not necessarily. Uh, it could still be recessive and there could just be hardly any of the thin stem dominant genes. So uh, it's, it's pop so I think you're probably right that maybe the wild types are usually dominant, but they don't have to be. Um, the, uh, the mutant line could be a dominant gene that's just so rare that it hardly ever pops up. Um, so yeah, just because something is rare doesn't mean that it can't have be a dominant gene. Um, do dominant genes, uh, yeah, it just might be a very rare gene. So that's a, a good point that you brought up. Wild type is not necessarily coming from dominant. It could have just come from a very common dom uh, recessive gene. And the mutant line is not necessarily recessive, it could just be a very rare dominant gene. So let's keep going through this together now. Now, one part of notation that's worth mentioning is that, um, so we're not using the Mendelian symbology anymore. Mendel had symbology of uppercase and lowercase letters, uppercase for dominant and lowercase for recessive, but we're not using Mendel's uh, symbols here. Instead, we're using, I think, a fellow named Morgan's symbols. So what Morgan did is that the letters are based on the mutant. So TS here stands for thin stem, although unfortunately this starts with a T too. But anyway, um, TS here stands for thin stem, and then the wild type has a plus. Maybe you've seen that. Yeah. So the plus means the wild type, no plus means the mutant. But again, this doesn't tell you anything about who's dominant and who's recessive. This doesn't tell us who is dominant and who is recessive. Okay. Now we're just going to have to figure out one thing at a time. Here we have some true breeding thin stemmed plants. Right. Now, does that tell us whether the thin trait is dominant or recessive? No, I think it just tells us that it's homozygous, right? It just tells you that these guys are homozygous. That's a good point. I wasn't thinking about this. They have to be homozygous because uh, if they're heterozygous, then every once in a while, the two recessive genes will get together and give you a different outcome. So we know that these are homozygous, so I'm going to write that down. Or maybe I'll write it down like this. Now I'll just say they're homozygous. But we don't know. Well, wait. If they're homozygous, they're, they must be homozygous for the thin stem trait, right? Uh -huh. So we know that the genotype here must be thin, thin. 
but we don't know if this is dominant or recessive. Now, of course, you can, um, with, with plants, you don't have to mate a plant with some, another one, you can have it self-pollinate. Um, so um, as long as it is homozygous, it's always gonna have the same offspring, and it doesn't matter whether this is dominant or recessive. Okay. Now, the wild type over here, do we know anything about the genotype of this plant? We know something about it. Well, we know that it has to have a PS plus. Okay. But we don't know if it's PS plus. But we don't know this one. So we know that it has to have at least one TS plus allele, but we don't know what goes over here. Yeah. So then we go to the first generation. Now, all the first generations have fixed stems. That, I think, tells us what goes here. Yeah, that it's got to be homozygous. It's got to be two, two TS pluses. Yeah. That's right. Because if, if this was a thin stem gene, then every once in a while that would meet up with a thin stem from here, and we would get a thin stem over here. So the fact that all the offspring have fixed stems tells us that this must be homozygous for the fixed stems. Very good. So you see how we're figuring out one step at a time. So what do we know about a plant from this true breeding line? Well, we know it's homozygous. But the choices make it seem like we can figure out whether it's dominant or recessive, right? I think so, because if it dominant, ah, yes. then it wouldn't matter right. whether you had the wild type, those wild type alleles of membership. That's right. So th something that would make that more obvious to me, I should have written, we know now what the genotype of the offspring is. What's the genotype of the offspring? They all must be heterozygotes. They're all getting one thin allele from this line and one thick from here, and then it should be obvious um, which of these is the dominant. So now we know that this must be the dominant. Oh, yeah, because we know that the phenotypes are all thick. This must be recessive. So we decided they're all homozygous recessive. Is that one of the choices? Which choice um, is that? Yes, it is. Uh, homozygous for the recessive UDTF allele. Which choice is that? It is C. Okay, well this is a really good question for us to go through. This is something that you're pretty sure this type of question you're likely to see. You can see these are not easy. Um, and the key technique I used here, I used a couple of key techniques. First of all, I wrote down all the information I was given. I wrote down all the information I was given. I tried to organize it as best as I could. And then I tried to figure out one little thing at a time. Even just figuring out what symbol you're going to use for something is helpful. For example, they gave us this symbol, so I should figure out this symbol or just figuring out one of the alleles over here. So every little thing you can figure out is going to be helpful to you. So we figured out one little thing and wrote it down, then we figured out another little thing and wrote it down until we finally had enough information to answer the question. What we can't do is just expect to jump to the right answer in one fell swoop. Yeah. These videos are offered on a pay what you like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos .htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you.